how's it going everyone? WTF Sexy Headphones here. Today marks the 37th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear accident that happened in 86, the largest nuclear incident in history. And what I want to talk to you guys about today more specifically is going to be <laughs> the dogs of Chernobyl. Um, for those of you guys who know me, the dogs of Chernobyl is particularly a favorite um, zone exclusion topic of mine. I even adopted a dog from Chernobyl. Her name is Katya. So it's a topic that hits home to me. Um, relatively recently, there was a study posted on science advances where they do a more in-depth study and they wanted to kind of take a look at how the dogs in the zone differentiate from a normal dog populace, um, how they're um, pretty much where they're from, how their genetics are and how they're adapting is kind of what they've been looking into. Um, before I kind of go into that study, um, by the way, the link for that is going to be down below. I have um, two different links for you guys. Um, one is going to be the science advances, which is a bit on pretty scientific. I got some charts from there. I'm going to break it down as much as I can for you guys. Um, the other one is a bit of more of a simplistic article to kind of break down and read. Um, before we go into that, though, I want to give you guys just a bit of info about the dogs of Chernobyl. Um, the dogs of Chernobyl who live in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, they have an average lifespan of about three to four years. Um, and due to the fact that their lifespan is that short, they actually don't live long enough to truly see the lasting impacts of radiation sickness. Um, the main causes that they believe for their passing is going to be things like predators, freezing weather, um, mainly in the environment that they live in is going to be the, the, the biggest mortality issue combined with other stressors like starvation and radiation. Um, so one of the main things that they go into is where are the dogs of Chernobyl from? Um, after the evacuation in 86 from the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs initiated a calling of abandoned pets, and this was to um, stop the potential spread of contaminants. It is believed that some of the dogs were able to evade the hunters, get out of the CNPP area, and that later on when the cleanup crew came around, that some of those dogs might have been taken care of by that cleanup crew. Um, which would kind of follow track to what goes on today. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, in the um, CNPP today, there's still, of course, a lot of dogs living around there, which is what this is all about. Um, but the power plant workers who still work there, they normally would feed them where they could, let them in during the winter and so forth. So during that time, they do get a little bit of care from the workers. Um, so that kind of follows track with that. So... I am going to pull up, we are going to go into next on the population study. I have some charts that I pulled that I'm going to bring up here for you guys to show as I give you some of this info to hopefully make it <laughs> a little bit easier for you. So let's uh, go into that. So the population study that they have with the dogs, um, they demonstrate that there are two locally distinct populations within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And that is gonna be the dogs that live in Chernobyl city, which is about 15 kilometers away from the CNPP. And then the dogs that live within the CNPP. Um, here, I'm gonna pop up this chart so you guys can see here. A total of 15 families were identified since 2017. And what surprised researchers the most was that the families pretty much stayed in their chosen areas and there wasn't much variation. So more or less, if they were dogs that were around Chernobyl City, they stayed in Chernobyl City. If they were dogs that were around um, the power plant, they stayed in the power plant. If they were in Pripyat, they stayed in Pripyat. Um, some of the dogs used the interim used fuel storage facilities as housing. I think they even specifically mentioned them in that article too, that if that's their den, like that is where they stay and that like they don't seem to wander. <laughs> they don't seem to wander and go off too far. So there's not a lot of variation. So going into the fact that these dogs don't move around much, um, they ended up finding out that there are three genetically independent populations. And then with dogs from each location more closely related to each other than those from the other locations. So more or less, depending on the area where the dogs are at, there's a bit more inbreeding going on. <laughs> um, where in other areas, it seems that they're having other dogs possibly introduced to the population. So that's what I'm gonna pull up now. I'm gonna pull up this one chart that is really interesting because it shows the population of the city areas, the type of dogs that are around those areas more particularly. And then it kind of goes into that inbreeding kind of aspect a little bit. Let me pull that up. Um, so it seems that the dogs living in the Chernobyl city area in general are more outbred because there are more be breeds being brought in. So workers are occasionally bringing in dogs, it seems like, um, to Chernobyl city and they are repopulating um, where that happens far less at the Chernobyl power plant. So for example, shepherd related breeds is likely ancestral within both 
um, Chernobyl exclusion populations, and these haplotypes have likely existed in the population for a long period of time. And conversely, if it ends up being um, sharing a pincher related breeds, it is observed mostly in dogs from Chernobyl City, suggesting a, re a recent introgression. So more or less, depending on where the dogs are and the families that they have formed, they are kind of having the same genetic makeup. And you can kind of track these in this here chart um, and kind of see what kind of dogs are where. And I found this very interesting because with Katia, I'm, I've been wanting to do one of those kind of genetic tests on Katia to see what she is. And um, so if you see in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant dogs, which I believe is where they picked Katia up from, um, it shows Eastern European shepherd dogs. And if I were to classify her as any kind of dog, she definitely looks the most like a shepherd. Um, and I've had um, some people um, who are part of the Chernobyl adoption dogs group. They have um, had their dogs tested and found out that a lot of them were, I think, shepherd and husky. So so most likely, um, that is probably what Katya is made out of, is shepherd, shepherd and possibly husky, because I know they have some of that too, but I think that is more of like a recent integration. Um, actually, hold on, let me read this little SERP from you guys. This gives a bit more info. Um, let me see. So, oh, and this kind of ties back to whether they think the population was from... Um, 86 or if it's before then. So the idea that the dogs are now living in a greater Chernobyl area are descendants of the pets left behind by evacuees after the nu nuclear disaster remains uncertain. Our findings indicate that the Chez populations, Chez's Chernobyl exclusion zone, populations share ancestry with shepherd related breeds, perhaps suggesting that they've descended from the same likely small founding population of the dogs that remained after the uh, disaster and subsequent calling. Evidence of genetic isolation within the CMPD population suggests that this group is most likely to represent the original dog population that inhabited the region before or immediately following the nuclear disaster. However, any breed that is not present in our pure dog data set would not have been revealed as a component of the current Chez dogs and is likely that at least some of the genetic composition of own dogs in this region from the 1980s is missing from our purebred data set. Thus, the extent of which the CMPP ancestors were reproductively isolated pets versus owned and free roaming pets or stray or semi-feral dogs before the nuclear disaster remains unclear. Um, the other interesting thing that I found that I want to um, point out here too, just going back to the breeds, is that um, the most prevalent breeds that they found in the population were ancestors of German Shepherds, Alpine, and related breeds such as St. Bernard's and Rottweilers, and one of the most recent ones they discovered was the Russian Hound. Very cool stuff. Um, the last thing I want to go into, you guys, is um, one more touch base on the adoption. I did a video not too long ago giving you guys an update about the dogs of Chernobyl adoption because I get those questions every now and again and people who reach out. And I wasn't 100% certain if the adoptions would be something that would continue or not. Um, so I'm going to read you guys a comment that I actually have from Clean Futures Fund. Um, they are the people who were doing the Dogs of Chernobyl Adoption Program, um, but also they're the people who go into the zone. They do a feeding program with the dogs as well as they do a clinic where they do spayed and neutering vaccinations to help um, take care of the dogs as much as they can. Um, let me read you that comment because they gave me some extra clarity. Um, the 34 puppies that were adopted in 2018 were a one-time special circumstance approval to remove them from the zone since their mother had died. We had to petition the zone authority management to allow us to remove them this one time. It is illegal to remove anything from the zone, including dogs. Unfortunately, since the Russian invasion, the zone has further tightened up the restrictions, making it even harder for the possibility to remove a dog, even for medical purposes. We have hoped we would be able to adopt out dogs after 2018, but unfortunately it is no longer possible. Um, one thing that they did mention too, um, there are many dogs and cats from Ukraine that have been abandoned when their owners fled for their safety. They now reside in shelters in Poland and desperately need a home. Um, so if there's anyone who I would like a Ukrainian pet, um, I'll see if they have any links or information on that. Um, they didn't post anything as far as, but I'm assuming if they know that a lot of them are in shelters in Poland, maybe they might like know where um, 
maybe have some names of some of those facilities. Um, so if any of you guys are interested in that, I can see if I can get you guys that info. Let me know in the comments. And if you are, I'll see if I can get that info and send it to you guys in a comment. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, the dogs that they have adopted out were in only one-time circumstance, and it does not look like right now in the future they will be able to adopt out any of the other dogs. Now, you guys can show your support for them by um, Clean Future Funds. They do merchandise like this, so they have the dogs of Chernobyl. Um, of course, obviously, when you, you'll get a t-shirt, and then they'll um, have their funds go straight to... Um, as I said, they do feeding programs when they can. They do a clinic where they go into the zone and spay, neuter, vaccinate the dogs as well. They help out where they can, which is super awesome. Um, sometimes they'll have cool little things like this. Um, this was literally made in Ukraine. Um, I believe this patch was $15. Again, it supports their cause. It's a sweet kind of cool little uh, patch for it too, which is super neat. Um, but also like you can just donate, like they have a feeding program. If you guys want, you can I'll link everything down below. They have a feeding program where you can um, donate. So that way you can help feed the dogs. Um, that is their main source of uh, nourishment from my understanding. As I said, sometimes the, the nuclear power plant workers do help them out by trying to feed and shelter them. But um, it is the Clean Futures Fund of that feeding program that's really going in there and trying to make a lot of feedings stations for the dogs and give them the best life that they can have without being able to be removed from the zone so i hope this was informative and interesting for you guys um links are all down below to clean futures fund to these articles um i hope you guys really enjoyed it and uh found it educational and and you know if you guys want to um be a part of it. Uh, again, links down below for Clean Futures Funds. So that way you guys have that and that way you have all that information. Um, last thing I want to go for into you guys, going back into our stalker-related styled content, um, I am going to get out to you guys very soon um, some more stalker gamma. Um, Slow down a little bit on that guy, but I'm going to get back into it. Um, just had a lot of stuff going on recently, which I'll update you guys in a different vlog. Um, other thing too related to stalker, <laughs> more or less. I'm... Um, <coughs> Because of the 37th, 37th anniversary of Chernobyl, I did a stalker inspired photo shoot for OnlyFans. Um, here is a preview for you guys if you kind of want to see what it looks like. Um, if that is something that you guys are into, check it out. I am super excited. I'm actually almost at 500 subs on OnlyFans. If you guys saw my vlog before, I didn't think that I would make it to 90, let alone getting to where I'm at now. So for those of you guys who are supporting me, thank you so much. I know it's new, different, and kind of weird for a person like me to do, but here we are. Um, but yeah, so that set is out. If you guys want some stalker inspired stuff, with me links down below as well <laughs> all right you guys you have a great rest of the day and i will see you in the rest of the week with some stalker content bye Fima power